Most anyone who stumbles across this video is probably all too familiar with the story of Bill Buckner, the hobbled veteran first baseman of the 1986 Red Sox, who despite putting together a long borderline Hall of Fame career, is unfairly remembered for just one play. A World Series Game 6 routine ground ball off the bat of Mookie Wilson that he botched, went right between his legs. The ball would roll harmlessly up the right field line, and the Mets would roll into Game 7 and take care of business. Though there were countless moments that could have sealed the deal for the Red Sox in this series, the media was hyper-focused on Buckner, a soft target, to a fan base that, at that time, was still building a comprehensive collection of evidence that they were cursed. You can't discount the magnitude of the moment. Here's the series win probability. Here's the Red Sox going from 98% down to 46% in just two at-bats. This Ray Knight single that scores Gary Carter, and then the Wilson at-bat that featured a Bob Stanley wild pitch that tied the game before the infamous E3 happened. And there was an entire Game 7 left to play in which the Mets hit the gas and never looked back, but people and notoriously sports fans in particular, latch on to these little moments and never let go. In Buckner's defense, rewatching that series reveals how totally weird that whole thing was. Check out this parachute guy landing right in front of Buckner earlier in the same game. How do you mentally recover from that? On this 90s ESPN special on Bill Buckner, there were two different quotes that have lived rent-free in my head for quite some time. The first was a quote from Buckner himself during a TV interview just 16 days before the blunder that would define his career. Bill Buckner laid the foundation of the single biggest self-fulfilling prophecy since the Bambinos called shot. If you squint hard enough, you can see him haunting Buckner in the background of the clip. The dreams are that you're going to have a great series and win, and uh, the nightmares are that you're going to let the winning run uh, score on a ground ball through your legs, so, <laughs> you know. The second quote, which closes the special, is Mookie Wilson's defense of Buckner, imploring fans to forgive him. People just did, you know, to understand that that's part of the game, you know, and that is, you know, no one died. <laughs> it was just one of those things that happened in sports. Hey, it's just a game. Nobody died. Well, Ironically, nearly 40 years later, the debate rages on as to whether or not a single solitary pitch was to blame for the most tragic demise of a baseball player. And, as fate would have it, as life imitates art just a little better in America's pastime, Bill Buckner's Boston Red Sox were on hand, literally the week prior to this World Series, during the 86 American League Championship Series against the California Angels. Reliever Donnie Moore was one strike away from the World Series. He just had to play through the pain as he had so many times before and get his signature splitter down as he had so many times before. He did not, and he owned up to it. Unlike Bill Buckner, who laughed off his blunder, Moore shouldered all the blame for the loss that would send the series back to Boston and shift all the momentum away from his team, saying, someone has to shoulder the blame, so I will. I threw that pitch, I lost the game. Despite his sincere apology, Angels fans never forgave him. In just a three-year span, he was out of town, then demoted to the minors, then out of baseball completely, then his California estate was up for sale, then his faithful wife Tanya was recovering from gunshot wounds, and Donnie Moore was deceased from turning the same gun on himself. The important question here is, how big of a role did baseball really play in this? But first, we have to do the best soul searching we possibly can. We need to know who Donnie Moore really was as a person, and we also need an introspection on fate. Setting Christopher Lloyd's meddling at the Big A aside, are all arbitrary baseball box scores something that's written in the stars, making the Buckners and the Moors of the world a pure victim of circumstance? Or can we really lower the microscope down close enough to a one single action made by one single player and hold them accountable for the trajectory of an entire sports franchise? When you word it that way, it seems ridiculous, yet it was happening simultaneously to two former Chicago Cubs teammates. Donnie Moore, now in Anaheim, and Bill Buckner, now in Boston. 
and it would carry on for decades. Are us baseball fans and baseball media really that toxic? Little League dads, absolutely. But as a consensus, do we really suck that much? Or are these just the types of situations where the true assholes come out of the woodwork? Managers and pitching coaches have to have faith in a relief pitcher, or he never gets called out to the mound in the first place. Faith in a higher power has shaped this country in a way that makes it totally unique to the rest of the world. Faith has shaped the game of baseball in the same way over the course of its history. Even the name across Donnie Moore's jersey was an expression of faith, and a reminder of America's largest city's relationship with the divine. Donnie Moore was born in Lubbock, Texas in 1954. Out of high school, he attended Ranger College in Ranger, Texas, and was drafted by the Chicago Cubs in the first round of the secondary phase of the 1973 MLB draft. His high school sweetheart, Tanya, was along for the ride. His firstborn daughter was not. She was given to Donnie's parents while he worked his way through the minors and his first years of the big leagues, finally joining them when she was six. Donnie came up alongside Bruce Suter, the six-time All-Star and 1979 NL Cy Young winner's career was defined by his split-fingered fastball. The splitter, though deceptive, takes a toll on the body. Both pitchers were injury-prone. Moore actually beat Suter to the big leagues, albeit briefly, in 1975 before becoming a full-time big leaguer in 1977. The journeyman would suit up for the Cardinals, Brewers, and Braves before settling with the Angels in 1982 on his first big contract. And here's where we join him for the most crucial outing of his life. October 12, 1985, the Angels had gone into the ninth inning with a 5-2 lead, which was mostly diminished by a two-run home run by Don Baylor. Two outs, one on, Dave Hindu Henderson steps up to the plate carrying a 196 average into the playoffs. Donnie Moore, expressionless, takes the mound. Here to do his job, sporting a poker face that doesn't reveal the rigors of a 162 game season, much less constant pain in his back caused by a bone spur. Back in those days, teams were more vocal about how many cortisone shots were going into their guys. Though he didn't show it, Moore was very much limping into this one. Moore blows two fastballs by Henderson, totally overpowering him. One more, and the Angels are in the World Series. But for reasons unknown to any fan, baseball writer, player, manager, or spiritual being, Donnie Moore went with the splitter. Henderson wasn't fooled. The Angels were able to get a run across in the bottom of the ninth, and Moore remained in the game. In the 11th, Dave Henderson clutched up yet again and hit a sacrifice fly that would win it for the Red Sox. The ups and downs Donnie Moore faced in baseball would be mirrored in his day-to-day -day life. Rough days at the ballpark would become rough days for Tanya at home, as Moore was known to abuse alcohol and physically abuse her. Moore was controlling and possessive to a sickening level, and though teammates were able to piece it together, only one was known to have ever confronted Moore about his home life, Angels outfielder George Hendrick, who once towered over Moore in the clubhouse, and out of his epic Fu Manchu asked, you want to hit somebody? But at this point, it had been going on for years. Despite the beating she took, Tanya never gave up on Donnie perhaps because she knew she was truly all he had. Though she had been open about all the problems in her marriage, she would never detail the childhood traumas that Donnie incurred that she knew made him the jealous, demeaning, aggressive person that he was behind closed doors. In Tanya's simple yet symbolic words, Donnie was no angel. Donnie Moore remained with the angels until 1988, but he was a shell of himself. The predator had become the prey. His walk on and off the mound, his facial expression, the relentless fans of Anaheim noticed. The disappointment from the 86 ALCS weighed on his already diminished mental health every day. Mental health, of course, is a term applied retroactively here, as therapy and the maintenance of one's mental well-being was highly stigmatized at that time, especially in the masculine realm of professional sports. 
Moore was picked up by the Royals for 1989, but only pitched in the minors for the Omaha Royals, getting knocked around and being released that June, effectively ending a 14-year career in professional baseball. Four weeks after returning home, Moore phoned his former Angels teammate Reggie Jackson to humbly ask for a loan to help with mortgage payments he could no longer afford. Jackson never told how much, only that it was, quote, enough he felt he should decline. Five weeks after returning home, Moore laid out three baseballs in his bedroom, a game ball from his first major league save, another one from the 1985 All-Star game, and one signed by Mr. October, Reggie Jackson. Beside them, he had written, Comfort in the time of loneliness, with several Bible verses, including Psalm 23, and also, Guidance in time of decision, with a few more verses. Donnie Moore walked to the living area of his home and put his 45 to his head in front of his entire family. When Tanya asked him if he was really going to do this in front of the kids, he turned the gun on her. Their daughter rushed her to the hospital and got her the care she needed to survive. Attempting to provide aid to his father, Moore's young son made the 911 call, wailing in desperation, calling on angels, but failing to find any solace. The day before Royal Spring Training, Davenport, Florida, 1989. Two old friends meet in a coffee shop, teammates once again, with the end of their careers in sight. Bill Buckner is the last person Donnie Moore seeks sympathy from. Donnie Moore is the last person Bill Buckner would choose to pick his brain on acts of forgiveness. Instead, they opt to talk about deer hunting. And the rest is just baseball history.